I guess. So in today's session, um, we're going to talk about finance especially. And I've noticed something about how uh, finance debates in general tend to be something that everyone fears and everyone thinks is something that is uh, going to be quite difficult to debate against and something that no one is exposed to and you're going to have to use a lot of jargon that essentially means that you don't try to make sense to the judge but essentially try to overload the debate by trying to explain things in a way that the judge thinks that you're smart. Um, hopefully, uh, what I'll be trying to do through this session is anyone who judges finance debates and anyone who does finance debates is able to uh, not be taken in just by the fact that there are someone there's someone using a lot of jargon and can actually make sense of what they're talking about in finance debates, right? So the essential uh, structure of this session is going to go from being very basic of what financial intermediaries are, what mistakes we make, and uh, to understand them, to moving on to explain prices as well as explaining to you what austerity is and what uh, different approaches that you could take in order to solve crisis. And uh, uh, lastly, explaining a little bit in terms of how you can debate, find, uh, uh, debate in debates which require emotions that require you to uh, debate about uh, hedge funds, etc. So that uh, you have a holistic idea of what's going on. Yeah. Right. So uh, moving on to the first general idea, and let's just talk, uh, figure out what we're going to be talking about, right? So first, the basics of finance debate. We're going to be talking about how the financial system works. We're going to explain the regulations. Then we're going to move on and explain to you what the stocks, bonds, and other important terms basically are and what they all mean and why they're important. Then we're going to talk about the financial crisis and we're going to explain exactly why uh, these crises did take place and also what eventually was the result of these crises and what uh, helped them and what eventually came out of them, right? And there's going to be a bunch of other stuff that we talk about, uh, as, as I mentioned here. And lastly, we're going to talk about how uh, we can, uh, teams can eventually win finance debates so that like there are certain things that obviously help in finance debates just the same way as you're going to have things that help in social debates or debates about uh, IR, etc. So yeah, we have to be here. So. So the basics of finance, right? How does the system work? So what we'll essentially be doing here is explaining to you what exactly the system essentially entails. So we're told that there's a financial system and that throughout the economy, we're going to have a large number of things that actually work and eventually result in us being able to have a complex financial system. But let's just understand the very basic of it. What we exactly mean when we say that the system is working or the system, like how we want the system to work. So firstly, what do we need to remember about the financial systems? First thing is, uh, before moving on to the entire complex idea of it all, let's just get a few things out of the way, right? The first thing is the financial system is extremely interdependent. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is uh, the system itself rests on the ability to affect other parts of the system the moment of time that you make changes in one part of it, which means that if you are going to uh, save certain banks or if you're going to give certain bailouts to certain, uh, certain companies, it's not as if the effect will be localized to that part portion only it will be it's very likely that the effect will move out and will be uh, will be uh, one that eventually captures the uh, rest of the economy as well and all parts of the economy no matter how dis distant of it will likely feel the effect of it and that's what financial systems actually represent so what do we mean by the, the why, why why is finance important right um finance is important primarily because it exists to allocate resources so the more complex an economy the more complex a financial system will be what do i mean by this so Finance is not a core function. You don't require um, finance in order to produce things. Uh, you will not require finance in order to determine your quality of life. What will you require it for? You will require it for making sure that the, the goods and the, um, uh, the services and the products that you require in the economy are produced in the most effective and the most efficient way possible, which is to say, uh, you have 100 taka and that 100 taka needs to get allocated in three different businesses that go on. Finance and the people who are in the financial system have developed tools and continually evolve and continually change things in order, when the financial system works perfectly, continually change and continually evolve in order to make sure that the most the businesses that will eventually create the most return in the economy are the ones that are funded and the ones that eventually get allocated the best resources. And that's the general idea of the financial system. So you can understand that the idea is that the financial system works in a way in order to support the rest of the economy because if the financial system did not work perfectly, then the rest of the economy will suffer significantly. And that's why finance is just that important 
the rest of the country is functioning. And that's why we frequently see uh, the indications of how well the country is doing by seeing how well the stock market is doing. Because the stock market is considered to be the health of the uh, country itself. It's considered to be the indicator of how much people believe in the country, and how many businesses are being started in the country, how much trade is being allocated in the country. We'll get to all of that. So what are some of the general misconceptions about finance news, right? One, that they are only specific to finance uh, motions or and have some uh, degree of effect on economic motions. Right, I should have just written finance as a finance debates, but regardless. Um, the general idea is that it's not true. Financial like arguments that are based on finance and what how the financial system works can be uh, basically can be expanded to a whole host of things. What's important is that you don't try and force them into debates that they don't have anything to do in. Uh, so yeah, always remember that even in finance debates, the most important stakeholders are the most vulnerable groups, and therefore you need to be very clear what you're trying to achieve here. Secondly, they're very difficult and full of technical jargon. I absolutely hate it whenever someone tries to use a bunch of technical jargon uh, and try to uh, confuse the opposition or the judge. Mostly because I understand when they're trying to use that technical jargon, but also secondly because I feel as if this is something that is bit, uh, something that doesn't really win you the debate, it's something that just confuses the judge and more importantly, is very likely that it's going to make you lose the debate because it doesn't make the arguments you're trying to prove don't make sense. Because at the end of the debate, it's still about the objectives you're trying to achieve, right? So just because you have a finance, they have financial knowledge, you've learned a lot of technical jargon doesn't help. And lastly, you need a lot of specific financial knowledge to research on finance itself. That's untrue. Uh, I hope that when you're done with this session, you will be able to understand most of the news that comes forward in financial newspapers, etc., etc. And so that won't be a problem. All right. So two most important parts of the system, right? Are the banking system, the stock market. Before we move on to the financial intermediaries and the financial uh, system itself, I'll just explain to you what it is that the role, like the role of the houses, how the households as well as the financial intermediaries are. So we know that the financial intermediary is obviously the banking system as well as the stock market. So what does how, what do households do? The important job of households essentially is to allocate is to supply resources to the financial system. Once, they, for example, businesses get started in the real economy. What is the real economy? The economy of uh, businesses, the economy of uh, manufacturing companies, the economy of service economy, the, uh, the economy of agriculture, right? That's a real economy where actual output goods are being produced, tangible things. The financial economy is an economy of uh, financial products, money, which is essentially me believing in a hundred dollar bill of get, to get me X number of things. That is absolutely worthless the moment of time that you don't have uh, that you don't have any sort of real goods that it can actually buy, right? Because there's no point having money if you're stuck in an island somewhere, right? So that's the general idea. Those are the two distinctions between it. The real economy where actual goods are produced and the financial economy, which deals with the one, obviously, as I said, the allocation of resources, but also with the idea of how you have um, money as well as the stock market, the banking system, and the financial intermediary that go on. And we're going to explain to you why we consider one the help of the other. Right. So what does the real economy do? Real economy has production. The real economy has significant amount, uh, has uh, people receiving wages. Wages which are received eventually are saved and these wages are essentially supplies to the financial intermediaries. Once you save this in the financial, uh, financial intermediaries or invest in the financial intermediaries as the stock market would suggest, what essentially happens is that these uh, intermediaries invest in other businesses in order to generate a greater amount of return. These are loans, this can be equity uh, stock that they buy or bonds that they invest in. Once those things are bought, once those things are invested in, what happens is this money eventually also go, goes back to the real economy and therefore there's a cycle that starts started, right? Because the households, etc., supply the money to the financial system, then the financial system takes them and supplies it out and allocates resources in the best way possible and obviously it makes a certain return on top of that general idea. I'm going to simplify this a lot, but understand that the entire idea is that you debate here, right? And obviously I'm going to create, I'm trying to create a base where you're able to understand everything else about the financial market, etc. once you do that on your own. So the general idea is, this is what the real economy and the uh, financial economy are going to coexist along and they co uh, they're eventually going to result in you being able to uh, have the best businesses and the ones that deserve it the best to come forward. That's why we see greater amounts of investment inside businesses like Apple. Uh, rather than, I don't know, some business that doesn't work essentially. Or uh, for example, uh, why would the stock, uh, market, why would the shares of uh, a company like Nokia never be as high as, or at least is no longer as high as Apple because Nokia didn't produce as much benefit to the economy as 
much benefit to the people as Apple potentially can, right? So clearly there's a need for that to do it here. Right, moving on to the banks. What do banks do? The objective is simply to collect money from you as deposits and allocate credit and give out loans. Uh, their general idea is that you, uh, what they do is they provide uh, credit to people who come up asking for loans and this means that they allocate money to the businesses, to the borrowers who are going to, one, most likely be able to pay it back, but one second, people who are going to, and because they're going to only allocate to people who are able to pay it back, they're most likely going to be allocating it to businesses that have the most potential for success. Be because if you allocate it to businesses that are not going to succeed, there's no point about it and you're not going to get your money back because the loan that you're giving you eventually want it back, right? So that's a general idea about banks and stuff. Exchanges, what do they do? Um, there are two kinds of uh, exchanges. Uh, one is the stock market and the bond market, and I will explain that in just a bit. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, before moving on to, yeah, uh, so just a second. Uh, before moving on to explaining the stock market and the bond exchanges, uh, the idea is that there are two kinds of markets. Uh, the primary market where firms issue sec securities and the secondary market where firms trade within themselves. What does that mean? The primary market essentially means a market where uh, Suppose you are Apple and now you're the, uh, you're the CEO of Apple and you want to, or the, sh or the shareholders of Apple and you want to uh, raise greater amounts of equity capital for Apple, where you're willing to dilute share on, uh, like ownership by floating a lot more, a, a larger number of your shares on the market. That's when the company does it themselves, that's the primary market. Secondary market is when I, who, uh, who bought a share of Apple a year back or 100 shares of Apple a year back, I am able to sell 50 of them to someone else, not to Apple. I could sell it to Apple, but that's a different thing that we don't have to talk about right now. But I, uh, most likely I'm going to sell it to someone else who's going to buy it. And the exchange between us is something that Apple is not, one, uh, does not, is not a part of, but secondly, is uh, likely to not have any sort of a role to play in it either. So that's the general idea of the uh, secondary market. So just try, wanted to explain the two markets to you so you don't get confused when someone claims idea of these two markets. Right. So. Uh, regulations. What do they do? Look, so regulations have generally been developed like uh, at the absolute initial system, we didn't have regulations. Uh, at the absolute uh, start of financial markets, we never really had regulations, right? Because uh, we didn't know what kind of things that perverse incentives that people would have in order to carry them out. Gradually, throughout the, throughout the years, we've been able to create lots of regulations that have eventually resulted in us being able to constrain the financial markets and prevent perverse incentives from developing within the system. What do I mean by that? What I mean is perverse incentives essentially exist when you're able to deal, you're able to take a certain amount of money and you're able to use it in ways that create a sort of benefit that was not intended with that money in the first place. Which is to say, people gave you that money and they gave you a certain amount of money to keep in your bank. The expectation that you're going to be responsible about it, you're going to make conservative instruments and you're only going to lend it out when you're able to see that you're going to have the best return out of it. It's very likely because you want greater amounts of return out of it because it's not your money. You will try to make sure that you give it to people who are likely to promise you greater interest, but are also likely to promise you great, uh, greater risk associated with it. So therefore, we have regulations to prevent banks from taking too much of a risk at people. You understand a certain amount of risk will always exist in the, uh, within the system because if risk doesn't exist, no reward exists either. That's a general basic rule of finance. If there's risk, there should be commensurate reward, right? If commensurate reward doesn't exist, then you're not going to, uh, sorry, terrible pronunciation, but regardless, uh, if the uh, reward that doesn't justify the risk doesn't exist, then you're not going to have uh, investment into that, right? So uh, we have significant amounts of regulations that prevent systems or institutions that are not required to take that risk and are not, uh, uh, that are that are not allowed to take that risk from taking the risk and gambling with your money, people's money, and doing whatever they want to do. So that would be a problem. Okay. First, uh, banks. So the banking system regulations are usually set by the central bank authority in Bangladesh. That's the Bangladesh Bank. Uh, and the idea is that there are a few things that the banking system wants to achieve when they have uh, when, with the regulation that they want to target. One is reduce the level of risk. Uh, obviously. Uh, the second one is systemic risk reduction. What do I mean by systemic risk? It means there's a risk of disruption through the entire system, as I said, because the system is interdependent on each other. When the banking system itself is, when one bank is likely to fail or one bank fails, right? You want to design the system in such a way and regulation in such a way as to make sure that the amount of effect that takes place, moment of time that you, uh, uh, that one bank fails is actually quite minimal and doesn't have as big of an effect as would have happened in the absence of this regulation uh, existing in the first place. So yeah, that's a very big important part of the system itself. 
and thirdly uh, and the rest of it is basic which is avoid the misuse of banks protect bank confidentiality and lastly proper credit allocation as i already said proper credit allocation is very important because you want to make sure that there is no political uh, interference in banks you want to make sure that the money actually goes to the places where uh, there is the greatest amount of benefit being uh, coming to the system so right what are banks governed by they are co governed by the uh, basel 3 laws i am not sure whether the pronunciation of this is right but i hope it is uh, the Basel III laws are essentially the international laws which are designed to enhance the above objectives. Uh, there are three because uh, the first two have been found to be inadequate and there was a revision eventually which has resulted in this. The last revision was after the 2008 financial crisis and we have successfully implemented it in Bangladesh as well. Right. What essentially did was increase the capital requirements at certain ratio that makes banks safer. Uh, at the end of this debate, I'll be telling you about regulations and why and why they can, why they're so, like, why they can be uh, why they can be misused or how to develop them in general but for now if anyone's just watching so far and doesn't go to the end of the video you'll still have a basic idea of what regulations are because regulations are exist uh, regulation exist to fulfill the above objectives and the market is continuously improving itself to try to achieve these objectives in a far better way right stock exchanges what do they do they are in, governed by individual countries security and stock commissions the general idea is they have a mandate to protect customers and have a, uh, create an orderly and stable financial system. So there's a, uh, the idea is that uh, since the market uh, is going to be, uh, since the market is going to be uh, a place where you allocate resources essentially with people's money, you uh, you want to make sure that there's an order toward, towards it all. But you also want to make sure that people who are uh, not as financially literate are not taken advantage of the same, like uh, so that there is no chance or there's little risk of uh, people not knowing what they're doing and it's used here to reduce the amount of uninformed consent that, get, that gets given and lastly the idea of fair treatment is that uh, there's lots it's very important to prevent things like insider trading etc because obviously large institutions are likely to have access to greater amounts of knowledge if they are allowed to do it and there are no laws against it and they can take advantage of this and can trade on the basis of knowledge that is not public yet so people who are not public are, uh, who are not uh, part of these institutions are likely to get disadvantaged by it but uh, the stock market has evolved to prevent that kind of uh, uh, that kind of situation from taking place, and it's quite important that these things do exist. And in most debates, they're going to be able to use these things to prove why the stock market is not going to be as perverse, it's not going to be as bad. Why do you talk about regulation so much? Because understand, regulations will always exist to protect markets from being harmed too much. And as I said, uh, right here, it's always be careful in selecting the degree of harm and proving that the harm indeed will happen. If you are on the side that is trying to prove that there is going to be a degree of harm prove that the harm will happen don't just claim the harm but also be very cognizant of the fact that the degree of harm is likely to be minimized by the uh, uh, system and regulation that i've talked about here but more importantly understand if you are the team that is being told that there is going to be a lot of harm for the change that they are proposing be very smart in order to point out that these things are going to be th uh, going to be taken care of by the system itself because the system has evolved in order to make sure that these kinds of things don't exist all the time in the systems right so basic financial literacy. Why am I talking to you about this? And this is uh, this refers back to the exchanges that I talked about. What are stocks? Consider that you take you have a company. The company is worth hundred bucks. Um, you take one taka. Oh, okay, this, you take two taka from forty nine of your friends. Each person now like all of them then invest in your company, and now each of them is given a simple piece of paper saying now you own two percent of this company, right? So now you and your 49 other friends are 2% owners of that company. You are all stockholders and you own 150th of the company, which means that you are, uh, uh, that you essentially own this company and uh, you are a part of the decision making process of this company. You will be asked for AGMs, you will be uh, uh, annual general meetings, you will be, uh, and when this company makes a profit, it has the chance to give you dividends, etc., etc. And yeah, the general idea is. Stocks allow you, and they uh, stocks are traded in the uh, uh, stock exchange where they there are two kinds of things that are get done. Like if you buy a stock, there are two kinds of in income that you're entitled to. The first one is the income through uh, yeah sorry. Uh, the first one is the income through capital gains, which is essentially when the price of the stock rises. Uh, what happens is that uh, the amount of, like the amount of wealth that you have, the financial wealth is essentially all of us financial wealth, right? Because all of your net worth is measured by your bank account, bank account, or financial wealth, etc. So get me. So yeah, the idea is uh, if you own a hundred taka of stock, that means that you are worth hundred bucks, right? And if tomorrow there's a greater demand for the stocks in your company, 
then as we know by the laws of demand and supply, the supply is lower, so demand is higher, so price rises. And as price rises, your stock becomes more valuable. If you sell it, you get a greater amount of money in return for selling that stock, money which has actual value in the real economy. Now, understand, capital gains can obviously be reversed because if the stock value falls and the demand is lower than supply, the price going to increase. So obviously, capital gains is something that is uh, something that can actually uh, maybe be dangerous for you eventually in the long run. But the general idea is most of the gains that people actually expect in the stock market happens through capital gains. The second is dividends. Dividends essentially are, have a lot to do with the idea that you get certain amount of money every month from the uh, or every uh, every, month, uh, every uh, quarter or every uh, every year from the firm. Uh, on in a, uh, and this is something that the firm can decide to do and if they choose not to they can they can also do that it's completely up to the firm and the management to decide whether or not they want to give you that money by dint of your ownership of the firm it's basically a, uh, a share of the profits that are being given to you because you're an owner of the company bonds are essentially um, things that are debt security so company a wants to raise 100 taka it issues 10 taka bonds and um, basically what happens is you get a certain amount of principal every month from because you bought that bond from the company again it's a piece of paper and at the end of the bonds maturity you get a uh, you get a, a total principal sum that you gave to the uh, to buy the bond you get it back completely and there are lots of things here that can be debated about and uh, the general idea is that you understand why bonds are quite crucial because the amount of like uh, because there could there could be they are extremely useful for companies to raise large amounts of uh, uh, money for expansion for uh, Greater amounts of improvement of the uh, company itself, or uh, improvements in the uh, improvements in what the company currently owns, etc., etc. Right? So yeah, so all of that exists. So what's the difference between bonds and stocks? Uh, the idea is uh, stocks are ownership. Stocks is ownership. Uh, bond is not. Bond is essentially just a claim that you have to the uh, earn, uh, eventual earnings of the firm itself. Bonds are guaranteed payments. They will always always be given. Dividends are not. They might not be given. And lastly, bonds are far faster and far more efficient to issue, which means you will see all around the world bond markets, especially in developed countries where uh, markets uh, are the various stock markets, uh, which are market dominated, bonds are bond markets outweigh the influence of stock markets by a large number, like insane amounts. Like I think it's like multiple of 10 or 12, depending on where it is, right? And uh, the idea is that if that is true, then uh, the, eff like the effects of a central bank uh, in involvement in the bond market or any other involvement in the uh, bond market is going to be massive. And therefore, we need to be very uh, uh, careful about the kinds of, kinds of changes that we're trying to achieve here because the, as the uh, interaction between interest rates, etc., will uh, be explained later on. But the general idea is that if there's a greater demand for some a company's bonds or a nation's bonds, which are, for example, because com a government can issue it too, the, uh, the uh, if there's a greater amount of demand, the price rises and uh, uh, the yield falls. So the interest rate that the bond is issuing, uh, uh, that the company, uh, the company or the institution has to give to you, falls. While if there's a lower amount of demand for the bond itself, then uh, uh, then the interest rate is obviously higher because now you are going to have to be given a greater amount of uh, benefit in order to buy, in order to buy the bond, right? So yeah, the general idea. Uh, before moving on to that, right? Sorry. Um, the two kinds of countries, bank-based and market-based. Bank-based countries are like countries like us, like Bangladesh, where the stock market is quite shit. <laughs> and uh, the market-based countries are mostly countries, in, uh, like uh, developed countries mostly, and the US, uh, for example, USA, Canada, UK, Australia, also like all of these countries have significantly very well-developed bond markets. It doesn't mean banks are small, banks are massive there as well, but the bond markets, like the bond, and the, sorry, the uh, markets itself, the stock market, the capital, uh, and the its entire capital market essentially is uh, based on the, uh, is, is far larger inside these countries, right? So understand when you advocate for government intervention, government uh, uh, government buying bonds or government selling bonds, that kind of markets, the kind of changes that you're trying to propose and kind of uh, effects that you're going to have inside these countries, right? Because in Bangladesh, you're going to likely be proposing changes in the banks, then you're going to have a greater effect in the economy by outside if you pro changes in the banks, obviously you're going to have an effect, but the effect is not going to be as large as changes in the market. But understand, as I said before, changes in the banks are not going to be insulated from changes in the bond market, right? Or sorry, the capital market, right? Which means that never say that change, just because you affect something in the uh, banks doesn't mean that the markets won't be affected. It will always be affected. And it's up to you in the debate to figure out how best to convince the judge that the change will be in a way that helps you and not the opposition. So yeah.
with that said, let's move on to the three crises and the main crux of this session itself. The three major financial crises that we're going to be talking about, right? One is the Great Depression, the second is the Asian financial crisis, and the third is the Great Recession. Yeah, uh, big terms. <laughs> but before we move on to the explanation of each of these crises, I'll just like to make a few things clear. Uh, what is the difference between recession and depression? Because most, a lot of people don't understand this. Uh, recession is economic contraction for two quarters. One quarter is three months. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, right. Uh, so if you divide the year up into four four parts, that's one quarter each. And recession is essentially if two continuous quarters, we don't improve. Like, the economy is growing negatively. Uh, depression is when uh, you have multiple years of economic contraction. And it is quite bad. And the only time we have had it before was in 1929, 1933, which is the Great Depression. We might have it now. We might have it because of the coronavirus and the COVID-19. And we are all going to get severely screwed uh, uh, because of this. But hopefully, uh, lessons have been learned to an extent, of course. And we are going to come out on the other side not as bad, hopefully. Uh, let's see. Let's see why it exactly it is exactly that I'm a little bit more hopeful about this than the Great Depression took place, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Right. The Asian financial crisis didn't happen all over the world. It happened mostly in Asia. So yeah, that's why it's called the Asian financial crisis. But the Great Depression, the Great Recession took place. Obviously, started in Western systems and hurt all over the and hurt us and hurt the entire world. So you can see who the bigger culprit is here, right? Right. Uh, so yeah, the general idea like Paul Simonson is very important. Like just know that she's an incredibly important economist. So what is said after the session, the session was that what we know about the global financial crisis that we don't really know very much, and that's something that is not very encouraging. As I had to explain to you what the crisis is and how you can take advantage of it uh, in debates. But um, the problem is the reason why I included this quote is because you need to understand that no one really knows uh, what the uh, like, what is what the fallout was or what the right actions were or what should have happened. Everyone has a general idea of it. Everyone thinks that this is what should have happened. And we have obviously ideas on based on things that have, like with survival bias included in them, in terms of the ones that people say are the most effective and the ones that are most useful. Definitely, like you can argue in debates against the conventional wisdom and do other things. Just putting that out there. So the Great Depression. What happened in the Great Depression? Um, industrial production fell by half. GDP fell by almost 30%. Unemployment by over 20%. Uh, went over 20 percent. Uh, nearly half of all banks failed, and uh, this happened. All of this, all of this, is just in the USA, which means that it is the only economy that had not been destroyed by the uh, uh, by the World War One, right? Which means that if you this happened there, imagine how much worse it was all over the world. Right? People, like, it was extremely bad, and this this devastated the U.S. economy for a long time, and is alleged to have had a large uh, alleged to have ended because of World War Two. But also uh, that there was a, like, how do I put this? That it was a precursor towards World War II, and that it helped spur World War II, also helped spur World War II by improving or facilitating the rise of autocratic leaders all over Europe. Yeah, but that is not a part of this debate. Although it's a very interesting thing, and I would like you to check it out. But what this caused, as you can see, all of this, like the effects, talk about industrial production falling by half, GDP falling. Unemployment increasing, right? All of this is supply side effects. All of this are is a supply of the economy failing to keep up with the demand of the economy, and eventually demand failing, right? So how did that happen? So initially there was a bubble in the market. So as obviously the stock market crashing was the start technically of the um, uh, system itself, but we'll eventually get to the stock market crashing. There were other things that led to this first. So why did it crash? First, consumer goods were being bought on credit. Uh, on credit essentially means that you are not really buying it with your money, you're buying it with, the, uh, with someone else's money essentially. This is uh, with banks and uh, from taking money from banks and taking loans, etc. So it was being bought on credit and so that was spurring on uh, uh, demand based on not on people being able to pay things back, but based on uh, everyone expecting that this was going to like the improvement in the economy is going to keep continuing to happen and therefore people were eventually going to be rich enough to pay it back. And you can always depend on the economy to keep improving. Agriculture, um, essentially what happened was they had, uh, there was a lot of debt for agriculture that had been taken during World War I. And what, uh, what essentially resulted in it was that uh, all that debt essentially resulted in not being, uh, like the far farms not being able to pay it back to the banks, which led to significant uh, defaults on the loans and significant losses for the banks themselves. 
why did this happen is because uh, since there was a lot of agriculture and there was a lot of supply uh, agricultural products and there was a lot of supply and you did not need as much of this after the war as you had needed before the war uh, this led to a significant mismatch in demand and supply prices fell and since prices have fallen the uh, uh, farmers could uh, pr produce more in order to gain the difference back and uh, uh, to gain more money and as they produce more demand was still stagnant and more and more supply meant the price kept falling to the point where at which the farmers had to default and say they cannot pay back the loans because there's no way that they can. Lastly, uh, the manufacturing companies uh, and real estate was also built upon a system of leverage. All of this was built upon a system of leverage where the money they were using to continuously spur the economy was money that was on paper only. Like they extended loans and unless they paid it back, the system would come crashing down because everyone needed money to create, uh, to continue uh, improving the economy. What this essentially means is that if I uh, loan you the money and you essentially never pay it back to me, then I can't pay it back to the people who have loaned me the money, which is essentially set to mean that depositors would never get back your money to the extent at the point at which your creditors, like the people that you're sorry, uh, your creditors, which are your depositors, will never get back the money as to the uh, at the point at which the people that you're loaning the money to, your debtors, are not paying you back the money, right? Because you don't have new money, you have to give it back, give back the money that they paid. So the idea was that because of significant amounts of leverage, this uh, the, uh, banks started because uh, the banks uh, had to not uh, were forced to say that they couldn't like uh, pay back uh, like they couldn't pay back all the depositors who had kept the money in there. But obviously this would not have been as bad, right? Because uh, not everyone came to claim their money at the same time, right? Uh, but what happened was there was a market crash in 1999. Uh, what the market crash meant was that because uh, these agricultural farms were failing, because manufacturing, there was no one to buy the manufacturing products, which had been made significantly out of leverage and without extra demand being used to create it, because companies wanted to cash in on the great demand, uh, great uh, cheap credit that was available at that amount of time. Uh, everyone started manufacturing and having greater amounts of agricultural output. As the uh, all of uh, a lot of these companies were floating in the stock market. Because they could not pay it back, uh, it, news came, obviously, uh, we published in the papers that look, these companies are failing. When this happened, people panicked in the stock market. And what happened was the stock market crashed because of the fact that uh, a lot of like people uh, started selling all of these stocks, the, ones, the stocks that were quite dangerous because they felt as if they wanted, to, like, because of the fact that if you hold this stock, while the price of the stock starts falling, you are essentially, your investment in it, which was, for example, 100 taka before, is now going to be worth essentially zero taka or one taka, primarily because no one wants to buy your money, uh, stock away from you, right? So the stock market crashed in 1929. The stock market was only 3% of the economy at that point of time. What led to the eventual actual harm? What led, led, to, led to it, and this is one thing we're going to refer back to again and again throughout this entire course, because finance is an uh, idea of consumer confidence, was a bank crush by the people. What people did was they uh, rushed the banks and they uh, asked for their money back because they felt as if the banks were also going to fail. And they were quite right because if you sit at home while everyone else withdraws their money uh, from the bank, um, at that point of time, eventually all the, the like everyone else withdraws the money and you go to the bank and the bank's like, I don't have any money to give to you. So I might as well go there first and get your money back, right? Because otherwise, what's the point? So yeah, that led to a bank rush. The bank started calling back loans because they had to pay back the creditors, uh, pay back the depositors somehow. And as they kept started calling back loans, obviously credit creation fell because of the fact that uh, there was like, how can you give credit away if you are not being able to pay back your depositors? So you need to keep the credit in, also call back all the credit outside, which led to a vicious cycle. And the deflationary cycle as, as, is out on the side here. There was no credit, which meant that uh, businesses could not continue expanding because they could not consider continue expanding. There was no need to hire as many workers or keep as many workers. So the workers started getting fired. Once they started getting fired, the problem was that their wages were not, obviously their wages are not being given. They are obviously the consumers also, right? The workers are the consumers. And if the consumers are not buying, uh, like don't have any money, they aren't going to be able to buy your products. So demand in the prices of these fell, uh, of products fell. As the demand in the prices of products fell, workers, more workers got fired because companies realized that they are now essentially operating at a slimmer profit margin because there are less products being sold. And since their supply and demand has increased, they have no reason to employ as many workers. Right. <laughs> what essentially this led to was that businesses could not pay back the loans. If businesses cannot pay back the loans and your creators ask for your money back, what do the banks do? They're screwed. These banks start failing. And what do you need then? You need the central bank to step in and central bank help you to improve. And central bank uh, uh, saves you because it gives a lot of money and prevents you from failing. Right. That's what happened in 2007. But remember, this was 
the old days. This was before uh, the great man uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, brought forward his theory. If that is uh, given, that is true. The problem was that the central banks at that time expected things to just heal themselves because uh, they were like that. Uh, they, they thought that obviously since this uh, entire economy had improved, had had grown to the point that it was unsustainable. Therefore, it needed to get rearranged. That it needed to fall down, fall back down. And once everything stabilized, you would restart from the beginning, and therefore uh, it would be okay. But the problem was that in the middle meantime, genuine like basic like human people were like obviously human people, uh, but uh, people on the ground were struggling because they were not having things to eat. Their uh, the pay their uh, like their wages were essentially had disappeared overnight, which essentially meant that these people were caught in a cycle of panic, and they needed big significant amounts of help. The problem was after this was the aftermath of World War One, which meant all of the countries outside were also uh, in Europe, etc., were also dependent on U.S. bank credit. But the credit now was frozen, as I already told you. So economically, these countries were also frozen. The economic economic activity in these countries also stopped, and with production falling, there was a huge necessity of having greater amounts of investment and so start the economy up, right? And so start people start buying, and there's greater amount of production. But the actual response was. U.S. and uh, Europe started imposing high tariffs so that only their goods can be bought. So the problem was everyone wanted to protect their companies because of the political pressure on them. Since no one bought anything, uh, production got hurt even more, and that essentially led to the Great Depression lasting for such a long time because no, everyone expected eventually to it, to it to eventually pass. That's not how it works, and therefore that didn't help at the same time. Why did it take such a long time to explain this? Because there are two things we learned from this entire thing, right? The first one is the importance of confidence in the economy and what happens if the consumers lose confidence in you. But secondly, we also understand how an economic crisis develops. Because it starts from a fairly innocuous thing, a company failing and leads to an entire economy collapsing, depending on the nature of the economy at that point of time. So next time in debates where you're required to do this, remember, you're not going to simply say jargon and get away with it. You're going to be facing teams, hopefully, who are able to explain things and explain how the economy gets screwed over. Because the moment of time that you're able to illustrate all this, it's obvious that you are very strong in this, right? So yeah, I was very uh, very lazy and didn't make the slide. So the general idea is, I'll talk about bailouts now. Uh, what are bailouts? Why are they important? So uh, before going on to bailouts, um, what are central banks? These are the basically the main banks in the country. They are the uh, uh, the bank that controls the money printing in the economy. They are the banks that control the money supply, they are the ones that control the money monetary policy inside the country, and they essentially decide what happens in the economy, right? Uh, they obviously, uh, they are work closely with the government, but in most countries, they are independent of the government, even though all governments would like to bring them under control so they can do whatever they want, they fuck with the, one, with the economy in order to uh, improve their chances of re election. But remember, it's very important that, um, that these stay independent primarily for a host of reasons that I cannot talk about right now because there's not enough time, and I'm already almost 40 minutes. I am sorry. Uh, I wanted to end this quite quickly, but I don't think that's going to be possible. So we're going to go about one, one and a half hours. I'll try to finish as quick as possible. Right. So central banks, I'm going to explain to what central banks do right now. This, uh, sorry, uh, the entire host of things that central banks do right now, what you need to understand is central banks are able to be the authority that prints money, who controls the uh, monetary policy, and who are able to, who are essentially able to take control, control of the economy and decide how much money and which uh, like which companies want to save if any that you want to save right now right so before moving on to the bailout itself why printing money does not uh, is not the solution to your economic problems everyone should know this i hope they do and like but the problem is i've learned of an embarrassingly large number of people who don't know that why printing money is not the solution to things so printing money is not a solution because it leads to inflation the greater amount of money is like so currently, Bangladesh gets in, uh, Bangladesh's inflation rate is 5.54 percent. Imagine tomorrow the government floods the economy with millions and billions of dollars, right? Um, to, uh, then everyone has more money, but the total amount of economic goods, like the goods that you can buy with that money, is still the same uh, because there's no not new, not, not more good like goods and foodstuffs and things that you want being produced. That is true. Then uh, that just me means that you have greater demand and more people can buy the products at the current price. Since the suppliers see that they can sell at a higher price, prices keep increasing until once again you can only afford the same things that you could afford before money was printed and allowed to pay back to you. Which essentially means is that uh, you caused inflation 
and the problem in, in, with inflation is that the prices don't go back no matter of time all the money that the people have suddenly stopped or suddenly uh, get spent right so the prices are permanently stuck up for a long time and they keep increasing and there's a cycle and it means that you're essentially uh, caught in a hyperinflation loop like germany or zimbabwe at first or you are just have like higher rates of inflation which are quite bad for example in bangladesh uh, inflation meant that uh, we had almost 10 percent inflation in 2012 11 12 right uh, along uh, uh, around that time general idea is inflation is very bad because it erodes the value of your money whatever money you're saving right so you had one million dollars saved before to today now the inflation is 100 percent your one million dollars is losing money losing value every day that's the general idea that's why you that banks pay you interest in the first place because that interest is not banks being generous to you is banks essentially saying that because your money's value is being eroded and you're keeping it with us we're willing to pay you this so that you keep it with us and so we can do our business with it that's the general idea what does bailout do? bailout is a large amount of money that the government pumps into the economy by printing etc uh what is wh who do they pump it to uh who do they give the money to they for example our bailout package in the government because of the coronavirus has been uh giving it to uh, uh garment factories giving it to essential areas essential businesses and giving it directly to the people so they can spend money and stimulate the economy right uh so what you can do is you can give it to banks they will keep the credit rolling and they will keep giving money to the people and i think uh, the credit disbursement by our banks is being done in the same way people buy and businesses run primarily because if businesses are able to get more money they are able to produce more they're able to hire more workers workers are able to buy more buy more using the wages they receive from the uh, uh, company and if they're able to buy more company uh, requires to produce more and you produce more they need more workers and the cycle continues like that if you give it to individual businesses obviously the same cycle continues and uh, you can argue that businesses are more like it's better to give it to businesses but let's be fair uh, banks and financial intermediaries are the ones who are most likely to be able to judge as i said which investments and which companies are the ones most worth saving in an ideal system obviously it's not going to be true all the time so uh, that's a general idea but understand that the success is entirely dependent on size of the economy and the size of the bailout and the public expectation management because suppose you raise uh, like you try to improve like the demand for uh, bailouts and you, you give a lot of money and you expect the system like the people to start buying products and businesses start making them but people are still not confident at the fact that your economy will recover then they will simply choose to save whatever money they get like the 1200 dollars stimulus check that everyone in usa is receiving suppose they don't spend any of it and they keep it in their economy and they keep it in their banks what's the point of that none no one's willing to invest in businesses no one's willing to do anything about with that money most likely goes to be putting it inside uh, under the pillows what's the point none and therefore that's the problem you need to make the public and the individuals on the ground believe that spending that money is important because spending that money leads to businesses working and if businesses work people get more money by wages and yeah 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 so yeah that's a general idea that's why it's important for have to have bailouts now why are bailouts bad sometimes uh not sometimes like obviously they have the negative effect will always be true the negative effect is that because bailouts are essentially um borrowing right you're not going to be like the obviously the government has some degree of uh, funding and some degree of how do I put this uh some degree of reserves but that reserve is not going to always be enough right uh to have the bailout because like what the us has a 2.3 trillion bailout package but their own total reserves of federal reserve itself were about 454 billion not even close right imagine for our country so everyone takes a significant amount of deficits and borrows money to in order to give the bailouts what's the implication of this one of all of this is the implication of all of this is that the government eventually has to pay back the money likely with higher interest rates and that puts a burden on future generations and it hurts the economy in the future right because in the future it's likely that the economy will not have as much government spending on essential infrastructure essential uh school services uh improving the education of the country things that are generally likely to cause a greater amount of economic uh, uh improvement inside the country or economic activity inside the country how does all of this play out what is important here is that you recognize that if the government takes money now future economic activity will stop will reduce the distinction you have to prove in debates today uh, debates from now is that once I take that money and I invest it now, the economy will be given a boost that is significant enough that I'll be able to survive not having uh, money in the future, uh, not having to pump money inside the country in the future. Which is to say, if I kickstart the economy now by uh, providing greater amounts of uh, bailouts, it will mean that eventually in the future, 
uh, the economy will continue rolling and the economy will continue improving and that will eventually result in us not needing to invest in the future and therefore we can safely borrow from the future right that's the general idea that's the general idea behind government debt and government deficits that you can eventually pay it back you don't have to pay it back right now government debt and deficits are a big are a thing that we can explain like you can continue to go about uh, explaining but then for now that's the general idea that you need to understand it, it, it to get um that's more of an econ like lecture in terms of what um government debt does etc and why government debts are tolerable sometimes and not tolerable at the others but there's a general idea borrowing is not free and therefore bailouts are quite important so now you know about bailouts so what are big ins and bail-ins suck okay <laughs> so the general idea of bail-ins is that they um so bailouts help out creditors right so um the depositors who will lose their money if the bank fails the bank the, the uh, lose their money and will simply not spend later on the uh, country uh, the bank gives money to the banks so that they can pay back these depositors and people don't lose the money and so they now have confidence that even if my money gets lost banks fail the government will be protected therefore i don't need to rush to the banks and demand my money back because i will not have to lose it all right uh what variance does is they push that problem of bailout on the consumers uh that uh you will have to lose a large percentage of your money and uh you will uh, that uh, the banks will be bailed out using the money that has already been deposited in uh, in them by the consumers so the, for example in the eurozone currently there is the idea of bail in where uh, uh, uninsured depositors this is essentially deposits over $100000 are going to be uh, reduced in amount are going to uh, suffer with if the bank is are going to be uh, not paid back or to the full full amount if the bank suffers uh, as in the bank is going through a hard time and cannot pay back the depositors and this is sometimes quite important primarily in situations where the government cannot do uh, cannot um, give the bailouts in the first place where the government is unable to provide a significant amount of money that will result in um, the bailout existing in the first place for the if the government can't uh, uh, borrow because it has shit um, credit rating or because no one wants to lend it or because um, a host of other reasons right at that point of time they will have to turn to bail ins and force the consumers to lose their money if the banks are too big to pay if the banks are so large that you cannot allow the banks to, uh, like uh, them to uh, fail to the extent where everyone's money gets lost right so that's a general idea that's why bail ins suck but you must know about them because you might have to argue for them at lots of periods of time right general idea yeah so you get it i hope um yeah all right last thing that i want to talk about um in parts of bailout itself is that look um i mean i talked about everything in an economic way and tell you that there are numbers that numbers work here governments are restrained etc you understand we talk about people who if like if we didn't help would starve would likely not have a job will commit suicide will likely not be able to send their children to school and will like significant significantly help for a long long period of all of these things are very real consequences don't forget them when you're trying to debate because this because no finance debate ever will be about um the finance or the economy no one's going to give you this debate primarily because you say banks are going to be better it's going to be about the people it's going to be about who makes the lives of the people better right so make sure that your debates are not about finance or the economy this debate must be about the individual people and what improves their lives okay so yeah be very careful about that Right, forty-eight. <laughs> okay, the East Asian financial crisis. Uh, the background summary of this was: uh, look, uh, before 1997, there was an economic boom inside inside these countries, which was mainly due to uh, capital influx because of the fact that these countries uh, were able to attract a lot of foreign capital, and once they attracted the foreign capital, they became extremely export-driven. Uh, what does this mean? This essentially means that these countries uh, became depend like uh, their large part of the economy was essentially dependent upon selling goods to countries abroad right uh, and there was no consumer base that was big enough inside their country that's a general idea of why they became export driven this will this will be relevant for all countries that you debate about who are um, driven by exports so your germany is your south korea etc but there are also other things that are going to be learn out of this so make sure there were stable exports you made the, they made the exchange rate back to the usd Uh, it was a hard peg, which means means that uh, if the USD rose, um, the uh, value of this country, value of their currencies will also rise. Okay, 
So once they had an influx of their uh, of a crazy amount of money inside both their stock markets and their banks. Why? Because they were offering generally higher rates to entice, uh, to entice uh, people to save inside their country, but also uh, because they had free constant convertibility of their money, which actually uh, capital account convertibility essentially meant that um, if you wanted, you could invest your money, and there was no problem in taking out, out your money from the country at a very small amount of time. This meant that an unsustainable bubble was created because their interest rates were relatively higher than other countries and because everyone saw that the country's uh, economy was booming, everyone invested inside the country. This created an absolutely unsustainable bubble. But the problem was uh, eventually there was a crash in the country and uh, eventually the real economy crashed, the stock market crashed, it led to a currency crash. And uh, as the currency crashed, it really, really destroyed the economies. And the ones that were most affected were Thailand, Indonesia and uh, South Korea. And there were a multiple responses to this crisis, and I'm going to explain to you why uh, this uh, or why this happened, and we're going to talk about austerity from this measure. And we're going to talk about austerity a little bit later too, but I would rather focus on it here because you can understand it from the context of this uh, uh, of the countries and the alternative way that you can approach this idea. I'm going to talk about it in the Great Recession as well, however. So bear with me. Okay. Uh, why did it happen, right? Um, so obviously I said that the stock market crashed, but obviously the stock market crashes because of the expectation of what happens in the real economy. So what happens? There are two currency factors. I said the U.S. Uh, raised uh, the U.S. Uh, currency. Uh, the currency was pegged. Sorry, I'm kind of parched. Uh, the currency was pegged with the uh, U.S. USD. When the U.S. raised interest, and this is very important, guys. Um, I understand this might get a little bit technical, but you need to bear with me because it's a very important for debates, right? So be very, uh, so just bear with me there. Okay, so what happened was the USA raised interest rates, which meant there was a significant outflow of money. Once there was a significant outflow of, uh, why? Because um, if your interest rates in the USA are, large, are higher, and obviously US economy was in a boom at that point of time too, and the US economy is far safer, because you know the US government is going to uh, make sure the banks don't fail, as I already mentioned in the great, uh, right, sorry, uh, I will mention in the great recession, for whatever. Um, as the US uh, raised interest rates, everyone took their money out of these countries, put, si put it inside US banks and US financial markets because they wanted it to be in a safer place. Previously, they had kept it here because the US interest rates were very low, so they were getting no returns. Now, the returns they are getting from Asian markets was just not enough to justify the risk that they are taking by investing in Asian markets. But obviously, Asia is more volatile than the USA. What this meant was, because US, uh, everyone was in, get putting money inside USA, Obviously, US is not. Uh, you demand, they demanded greater amounts of US dollars to invest inside the USA. This made the currency port, like the currency peg, which uh, the, 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 meant that the uh, value of the currencies that these countries had also rose substantially, right? Because obviously, your uh, your uh, the since the demand for the US do, has risen, US dollar increases with respect to the other currencies. And if your peg is back to the US dollar, it means that uh, uh, if your currency was worth 10 Indian rupees at that point of time. If the USD rises, now your currency will be worth 12 Indian rupees. That obviously makes your export very expensive because no one outside the country is going to pay you more in their own money to buy your export. Obviously, they're going to pay you more, but obviously, uh, they're very expensive because the demand fell. And therefore, as I said, they were export driven. You can see where this is leading, right? A lot of the country companies paid. External factors. Um, there was a sharp decline in semiconductor prices and the devaluation of Japanese and Chinese currencies. What this led was that uh, what this meant was that the Japanese and Chinese currencies uh, devaluing meant their uh, the Japanese and Chinese exports became less expensive, and since they were competing on the same market, their exports further took another hit, second hit to the export uh, export market. Third one was that there's an internal set of internal problems, right? This is Asian crony capitalism. What does this mean? Crony capitalism in uh, is prevalent all over the world. In this particular case, the Crony capitalism, is, uh, this refers to, is the set is is the capitalism which uh, is the uh, set of like inside the inside a capitalistic economy, you are expected to allocate resources to the ones that are producing the most value for the out output, right? Uh, and people demand the most. But the problem is that is not always the case, primarily because, well, let's be honest, uh, everyone has some degree of government uh, governmental involvement and. There was a relatively larger amount of uh, crony capitalism going on over here, where um, what essentially meant was uh, that uh, a lot of companies, for example, the Shea Balls inside South Korea, these companies were able to uh, ask the government for help every single time 
and they, even when they weren't extremely uh, even when they weren't doing as well the government protected them because they were significant links with the government and anything that happened to these uh, companies would significantly harm the government itself right so because of that the money that was coming in look if your money is coming inside the country if a lot of money is coming inside the country you can use that to stimulate a real economy right you can use that to improve your own market you can use that to improve the amount of uh, the country uh, companies that you currently have which means if you diversify your exports that would mean that you have like even if your export for example the sharp decline in semiconductor prices takes place you can export other things that make up the difference from that but that didn't happen why because the uh, crony capitalism only uh, being giving money from these banks and uh, forcing them to give loans etc only to those companies which the com uh, which the uh, sorry uh, which the government believed uh, which, which benefited the government so what eventually led to was a bubble that was being created where everyone was investing but no one really knew that the economy itself was absolute in absolute tatters and anything bad was going to take it away the internal uh, the currency factors and the uh, external factors eventually were the bad things that happened to the country so having said all that um what uh, right so next is the response that we have to this right yeah um so what did malaysia do? Uh, so i'll uh, wait we're going to talk about malaysia in a second because it was right uh, what did indonesia do what indonesia do it was uh, agree that the, with the uh, international monetary fund that austerity and um sharp measures were the way to go and they uh, kept their capital account uh completely free which meant more and more money was able to be taken out of the country at just whenever uh whenever the investors and the people who were given the money itself felt like it what does this mean though? this means that uh the moment at which the investors inside the country felt as if uh the investors from outside felt as if or investors inside the country felt as if their money was at risk uh and the country was not responding as well they start, they would remove their money from the country invest it somewhere else the problem was the stock market and the banks were not ready for this kind of withdrawal from them and obviously this led to a bank run a bank rush as happened before what this led to was that um uh, uh so the entire country was coming to a standstill because credit creation again was stopping the business activity was already reducing and since the export market had already started falling and the money was being taken away the country had come to the same cycle that had occupied the USA and the, all the other countries during the great depression um so what austerity does is austerity doesn't recommend uh, austerity recommends that you force uh, the government to cut spending increase taxes and make sure that uh, people uh, and reduce spending because the government is now also leveraged and the government can essentially uh, earn back the money and that people suffer for now so that the economy eventually essentially corrects itself right so the logic behind austerity is very simple um the logic behind it is that the government itself is able yeah hi, sorry my um uh, laptop stopped we can be here for a second right um right anyway so the asian financial crisis right um the response for from malaysia and the response from indonesia so why is Austra what's the problem with austerity austerity essentially means reducing government spending in a crisis where you don't already have consumer confidence your austerity measures mean that the government itself is also reducing spending decreasing the confidence of the people if the confidence of the people continues to decrease however you have a situation where um the component of gdp which is spending is continuously reducing that reduction essentially means that your gdp will continue to fall your aggregate demand will continue to fall and what will result in your businesses will produce lower amounts of goods and services now the problem like obviously there's a problem with austerity but there's a reason why austerity was introduced in the first place right the reason why austerity was introduced in the first place is also expected that government debt has was too high the government debt of these countries was obviously a little bit high at that point of time primarily because they had been borrowing beyond their means for a few years till uh, till that day um we're not going to explain to you why the borrowing had happened so far we're going to explain to you that the borrowing existed uh, was high or uh, was high thing is that you can apply it to all those debates where the borrowing is likely to also be high or right. what's the problem when the austerity is uh, recommended it's used to reduce government spending and so that the bond yields of the government drop which means that people demand more bonds of the government because now the government is less likely to default on those bonds because primarily they are um, 
less likely to be borrowing extra money from people. And uh, obviously, bonds are dependent on the entity that you took, uh, that you bought the bond from, paying it back, right? But if the entity keeps, um, how do I put this? Uh, if the government, for example, if the government keeps borrowing, keeps extra money borrowed, if they have X of your money borrowed, and they now borrow some extra money from outside. That means that it's also going to be likely that before they can pay you back their money, they're less likely to be solvent later on, right? And they might they might default and they might not be able to pay anyone back. Their money. That's a very big risk that the company that anyone takes whenever they uh, uh, lend uh, lend their money to people. Uh, the effect is that that essentially is called the credit risk of the economy. So, right? General idea is that the Asian financial uh, during the Asian financial crisis, austerity did get uh, austerity was introduced. And austerity works to reduce the total amount of debt the government has. You're always going to get a reduced amount of debt on the government. That's going to be true for Greece. It's going to be true for Thailand. It's going to be true for Indonesia. It's also going to be true for UK, right? Which has implemented austerity for so many years. General idea is once you get that, once the consumer sees that the uh, austerity uh, measures are reducing the total amount of debt, they're most likely to invest in government bonds more. They're most likely to invest in the country because they realize that the government can borrow if needed. The government is now a, a stronger actor as they've expected it to previously. That's the general idea behind austerity itself, that it makes the government look less um, insolvent. It makes the government look less risky. And the government is less risky, it's likely the government is going to be able to uh, keep the company, country afloat for a longer period of time if there is another crisis, right? Because suppose, and this is general idea, which I don't disagree with the concept of it, but this is general idea, right? Is that um, if your country is going through a bad time, and the only borrower that can fix the economy is your government and your government is one that everyone wants to borrow, uh, wants to lend to then there's no problem the government can simply borrow from them something that is true for bangladesh because bangladesh never defaulted in history and therefore people are willing to lend to us but assume you are a country like greece no one wants to lend to you you are extremely dangerous because you might just default but you have a history of defaulting what happens then uh, what you need to do is essentially uh, pay higher amounts of interest to these countries, you know, just to get the borrow, just to get money from them. But the higher amount of interest comes at the expense of future generations having to pay a great amount of money and not being able to spend it in the future as well, right? That's why austerity happens now, asking, say, telling people that, look, uh, we are going to uh, tighten our belts, we are going to reduce spending, we are going to reduce public sector salaries, and we are going to use and uh, do that uh, to make sure the consumer confidence in the economy comes back up. Why do I think that's stupid? Um, before I explain why that's stupid, uh, I'm going to rant against the IMF, right? Um, look, the IMF is dominated by Western interests. The Western interest is that they want full capital flows throughout the economy. They want to make sure the full convertibility exists and that uh, the stock market is constantly improved and con constantly supported. So obviously, there is an incentive from these countries, uh, from all these countries to uh, for the uh, Western countries to make sure that your stock market is open so that their investors and the ones that have political power to lobby uh, their foreign policy uh, are protected in general. But also, uh, IMF recommends austerity because they argue that austerity leads to positive measures. But as we are going to see inside Indonesia, inside this uh, uh, idea of what happened to Indonesia, that isn't necessarily true. So, what did Indonesia do? It agreed with the IMF. Um, it imposed austerity. It reduces GDP because obviously if you reduce the amount of spending that you're doing throughout the economy, no one is willing to buy anything. Everyone feels bad. Everyone feels scared and no one buys anything and that leads to a cycle. But uh, eventually once the economy improves to the point where it is able to pay it back, um, at that point of time, your growth is expected to start picking up. And uh, uh, successes that people pointed towards this has been in places like Latvia, have been uh, Latvia and other some European countries where growth apparently we started after austerity measures uh, reduced debt. Um, the thing is, in Th Indonesia, what happened was once they agreed with the IMF, austerity uh, 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 and implemented austerity is a lot significant ground to Malaysia because if you look at the amount of development that has taken place in Malaysia compared to Australia, uh, compared to Indonesia, it's staggering. And a main one of the main reasons is this crisis and the impacts of that. So what did Malaysia do? It went against the IMF austerity measures and they input capital controls and stopped the speculation on their currency, which essentially meant that people could not take the money out at any point of time, which meant that banks were far likely to be healthier because they did not have to pay back everyone at the same period of time and uh, the money was less volatile and the consumer confidence was a little bit higher. But more importantly, their government didn't reduce the amount of spending that they were doing. The government continued spending. What this led to was the government, the people feeling as if the government is going to continue to take care of the economy no matter what happens. Why is this important? Primarily because if people feel as if the government will continuously take care of uh, take care of the economy and they don't have to worry about the government screwing it up and the government not 
willing to be a positive actor, not willing to be a actor that is willing to take responsibility for uh, the country itself. At that point of time, they're far more likely to start spending, they're far more likely to start doing things that are um, in general uh, going to boost the economy and restart the economy to become much better. And the person who was most responsible for that uh, in Malaysia or was responsible for that in Malaysia was Mahathir Muhammad. He was extremely, uh, uh, he was uh, brief, I would put it. I'm not sure how, uh, what the word would be to go against the IMF and country like Thailand, uh, even, uh, in, even Thailand and Indonesia were uh, all across, uh, the ones that were getting hurt the most were willing to implement the austerity measure that the uh, IMF uh, forced them under uh, in order to qualify for any sort of loans, etc. Uh, Malaysia did not take it from them. Malaysia made sure that uh, it continued investing inside its country and its economy and it did not stop spending and eventually led to a greater amount of development in Malaysia. So that's a clear indication of where IMF, uh, of where austerity measures have actually improved the country. So that's a general idea, right? Um, yeah. So before moving on, I'm just going to explain a bit of economics here, right? Look, if a country develops through foreign capital, the problem is the money can be is volatile. It's, it can be pulled out of your country, especially if panic ensues and there's a small problem inside the development of your country. Moment of time, that money itself is done through your own means and it's not through debt. And it's not through your institutions being leveraged inside the country. At that point of time, it's very unlikely that um, your economy is going to get hurt in the same manner, primarily because um, your economy is likely to be a lot safer. Your economy is less likely to have people who simply turn, take their money away the moment of time there's any sort of crisis inside the country because obviously the ones who are investing in your country are the people who live inside it. And therefore, it's quite important that your economy is able to take care and manage these problems. And therefore, uh, that you spend inside your economy, right? Uh, just an example of how bad it was. Just look at the Asian currencies at that point of time, right? Look at how steeply these, they, they fell after they were allowed to float. Like all, like these, like these econo these uh, currencies were pegged to the U.S. dollar, right? The the government registered selling them, government registered floating them on the stock market for floating them on the currency market, and they tried to manage these currencies by selling a lot more U.S. dollars that they had accumulated uh, on, beforehand. The problem was that did not help at all, and you can see that uh, the Thai baht fell 40%, the Indonesian rupiah was held, hurt the most and fell the largest amount in Malaysian ringgit, which fell significantly, but Malaysia still made it back. And you can understand the degree of effect that it takes, that uh, the, the amount of harm that got created here, right? Because understand if the economy led to the Asian currencies falling by this larger amount, it meant that the economy was able to afford a lot fewer of the goods and services that it really needed to, uh, to survive inside the economy, inside, inside, the, uh, inside the situation to begin with in the first place, right? The Asian currencies, as they fell, they reduced the purchasing power of the people inside this current, inside these countries. And the, uh, and as the prices fell, people were able to afford less, and they were able to like the uh, businesses were able to afford fewer products, and they fired workers, and that led to the entire cycle that we talked about in the Great Depression. There were a record high number of suicides because of people who could not bear this amount of economic downturn. And yeah, it's quite quite bad. Uh, but you get the general idea of how these things happen, right? So you know how to do debates where countries, uh, you are asked to debate on austerity measures because you know what the pros and cons of austerity are, how austerity works, when austerity can be applied and why austerity might be bad and potentially might be good in certain cases. That it can be shown in the case of Latvia. Because if we are going to debate and talk about why austerity is good, right, which I personally don't believe, so I'm sorry if my um, beliefs, uh, beliefs are cover, uh, coloring the explanation of austerity itself. The general idea is uh, austerity essentially uh, is useful because one, it reduces the dependence of the for, uh, future generations, which means once the austerity measures stop, uh, the economy can then borrow at will, and it can borrow at significant amounts. And if it borrows at significant amounts, then it will be able to restart consumer confidence, restart businesses, and then the country becomes uh, has goes through a period of significant boom, etc. Right? And then you, like, you can essentially reset the country's economy back to zero and then start improving it. That's the thing that the UK followed uh, post uh, recession. And I'm going to explain uh, post 2008 recession. I'm going to explain that later. Uh, I feel like I'm going to say that I'm saying that a lot. But yeah, the general idea is that consumer confidence doesn't work that way, and we're going to explain that now. Right? Okay. The Great Recession, the recession of our times, when uh, everyone uh, felt as if we're, we're quite screwed and that uh, things were quite bad. 
And uh, this isn't surprising because of the fact that uh, if you look at the effects that took place at that point of time, uh, the national employment, this is just USA by the way, uh, just excluding to the USA was the one that has, um, that started the domino effect and it eventually spread throughout the other system, through the other countries. And I'm just not going to explain this again, but just remember, as I told you, financial effects are not localized. They spread throughout the system. This is what it means. USA started it all. Guess who got hurt? China, then the rest of the uh, Europe, the rest of the world, India, everyone, right? But the people, like the ones that get hurt the least, are the ones who are least involved with the international capital uh, flows. At that point of time, Bangladesh was a lot less involved with the capital flows. Uh, uh, in, as a point of fact, in the Asian financial crisis, India was less open, and its con com uh, capital account convertibility was not as much as before. Uh, was not as much as the other countries, which meant that India was affected less by the financial crisis, even though it was because of the US, US interest rates, etc. So you see the massive amount of harm that can take place to one decision in one part of the financial system. That's why uh, this uh, finance is so important. Primarily because you can argue this in any system anywhere, right? You can argue about how fi uh, the financial system will react to this. Again, it's very important. Don't try to put this, uh, like, try to run finance arguments and short selling arguments. Uh, I've heard certain people run it. Uh, short selling arguments in um, debates about uh, in social debates or I don't know in political debates or whatever like any economic series right like don't try to say that like these things work in every scenario they don't not every, like something like you can't expect to win debates based on irrelevant information so be very careful when you use any of these arguments any arguments based on the uh, financial system I understand there's a large number of debates that they can be used and they can be used very well so when you know what you're talking about uh, then you can run finance arguments okay um, so you see the statistics, statistics on the right, I'm not going to explain them, uh, just pause the video and see it. Right, the background summary. So Alan Greenspan and the Fed reduced interest rates in 2004. Here's the problem. If you reduce interest rates in a situation where the government is, um, how do I put this? Yeah, so if you reduce interest rates in a situation where your country is not improving, where your country, economic growth is falling, where you need businesses to start investing more, that point of time, businesses start investing more and there's a uh, and the stock market starts improving and countries and uh, uh, the country starts uh, producing more and you reach the uh, high level of some GDP, right? Problem is, if you reduce interest rates in a situation where your economy is already doing quite well, as the USA was doing back in, the, uh, back in 2004, that point of time, the problem becomes that um, the stock market itself, uh, everything, everyone in the economy gets access to very cheap credit. Remember cheap credit? Yeah, that, that what was that happened in the Great Depression. And we have that back again. Um, so what happened was uh, the, uh, once the interest rate dropped, the entire system made, made sure that uh, the entire system essentially uh, became a situation where uh, reduced interest rates led to, uh, sorry, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, my bad. Um, so what essentially led to was the, uh, uh, the Fed once they reduced the interest rates, were able to uh, uh, were able to uh, allow businesses to have access to cheaper amounts of credit. Cheaper amounts of credit essentially meant that businesses were investing a lot more and creating more and more products, which eventually led to a lot more people having a lot more money because the interest rate weren't just reduced for businesses; they were also reduced for individuals. And one of the main things that they that the economy at that point of time wanted to propose was that everyone should have a house. No one should not have a house, and everyone should buy a house. That's stupid. Those who can afford a house should buy a house. Those who can should not buy a house. They should at best rent, at worst they should try and like build up the capacity to buy a house, right? Because if you take out a mortgage, which is essentially a loan that you buy on the uh, that you take out on the base uh, on the back of um, uh, that you take out on the back of uh, the property you're purchasing, and if you cannot pay back the loan at a certain period of time, you have to uh, you cannot pay back the loan at a certain period of time. Right, so cheap credit in the economy with uh, individuals can borrow and uh, the amount of mortgages in the USA started rising like crazy. And uh, if the uh, mortgages are essentially loans that you take on the, um, forgot the term for it. Uh, right, sorry. Um, so uh, on, the, uh, on the collateral of the house that you're buying with that loan itself. What does this mean? This essentially means that if you buy a house and you, have a, uh, you take a mortgage out on it, then you eventually pay back the mortgage uh, with the, and the interest on the principal little by little every month. And if you can't pay it back, then the, you default on it and the house that you own is going to be sold or, and the bank is going to recoup its money, right? General idea is, 
this created the uh, this created a housing bubble where everyone who could buy a house essentially even those who couldn't buy a house started buying houses all over the country that rose like made demand rise steeply like uh, demand started rising crazy high primarily because of the fact that everyone has access to cheap credit and uh, like basically if you're uh, i'm going to explain why this eventually happened but the general idea is simple if you're able to buy if you're able to buy a house in 2010 and it costs hundred thousand dollars and um, two years later, the demand for that house rises and it's now worth $120,000. And your interest that you were paying um, is far less than the amount of worth that your house, uh, the amount your house is worth at that point of time. It makes sense for everyone to buy that house because um, you can just sell that house later for a large amount of money and then pay back the bank if you really require it to, right? Because the worth of your house is increasing much faster than the amount of interest that you're having to pay. That was the general idea. That was being, that that existed back in 2004 and 2005, etc. That that created and led up to the crisis. Primarily because if I can take uh, uh, primarily because if I can take a loan now, it means that uh, I uh, I can simply re uh, refinance my mortgage at lower rates as the interest rates have fallen down. What is what this meant was those who were taking cheap credit from before already existed, but now there are a large number of people who are refinancing their mortgages by Paying back uh, by uh, essentially paying back the entire earlier mortgage from before by taking another uh, uh, use, using money from another loan they had taken because now the interest rates were lower so they had refinanced it and now everyone had access to cheap credit so you see the cycle new people who want to have access to the loans also have access to cheap credit while the people who had access, who taken the loans before are now refinancing those loans and taking more loans on the basic or best basis of their house now using to do whatever they want right so um, the uh, the situation that eventually became was uh, bank give loans to the people, cheap credit exists, and all of that happens, right? And uh, the problem became that there were a lot of safeguards of the financial system, which we're going to talk about how they failed. And the system was built like a domino. And what happened was it eventually came crashing down, and the effects are on the right. So um, moving on to the structure of the bubble that was created. Um, second, yeah, all right, such other bubble that was created. So. What did I talk about? Mortgages. Mortgages are essentially loans that you give out on the collateral of a house. What do they do? Uh, in, uh, what essentially that uh, this happens is the banks take the loan and the bank loans, uh, the bank then sells the cash flow on these payments. What, what does this mean? So um, it's a complex uh, thing to define. So I'm just going to try and break it down as simplistically as I can, right? So assume that you have that you took the that you took a loan from the bank uh, the bank uh, the loan that you take from a bank is a bank's asset right uh, because the bank is receiving money from it and obviously uh, not everyone learns accounting but the general idea is uh, if you uh, if you have money coming inside from something that's an asset now this asset you could wait for it and you could have to see your money tied up in this asset for a long period of time or you could do what the banks did uh, what you can do is essentially um, Sell, uh, sell these uh, mortgages, and um, second, right. Um, what you can essentially do is use these mortgages to uh, uh, sell it, sell off the cash flows on these mortgages by creating uh, credit payments. What does this mean? This means that um, you get a bunch of mortgages together, and then you create what are essentially called uh, CBOs and CDOs. So uh, uh, and CMOs, etc. So basically, the idea is uh, mortgage payments. Lots, uh, lots of mortgages were collected together. They were collated, and then they were sold as a financial instrument. People could, investors could buy that financial instrument and receive monthly payments on behalf of that financial instrument. So that became essentially a bond, and uh, that de that collateralized debt obligations, like they became collateralized bond obligations and collateralized debt obligations. What does this mean? That um, the many different cash flows which su support the regular payments are now collated together inside a big uh, inside a num inside one instrument and everyone who invested inside the collateralized debt instrument is now able to pay uh, is now able to receive a certain monthly amount from the uh, um, uh, from the monthly payment that mortgage owners pay to the bank every month so how does this work right so simple banks created uh, as i said the banks created collateralized debt obligations Debt obligations are sold as particular securities 
financial securities, you can buy a certain part of that obligation and you can receive a money on the basis of that obligation every month, right? And you can eventually receive the entirety of the amount that you bought before. Sound like a bond, right? Yeah, that's because mostly it was like a bond. That's a general idea that you must hold on to. You don't need to explain, uh, understand anything beyond this. This is a general idea of what uh, collateralized their obligations really look like. Therefore, the many different cash flows which support regular payments to the shareholders in the CBOs, right? Because the mortgage payments, which are, suppose you and I make as mortgage owners, we pay it to the bank. The bank then you takes that money and pays it to the uh, or different shareholders inside the collateralized debt obligation. Now, why did the banks do the collateralized debt obligation? Primarily because if you are able to uh, sell off that loan and you can get a certain amount of money and you can get a certain amount of money from it, you can use that to create even more mortgages and you can get money from those mortgages and create and create even more CDOs where you can then give away money and get even get even more mortgages and create more CDOs. Right? So you see the cycle. For the banks, it was very useful because if you create more CBOs, you are going to get a certain fees for operating that CBO in the first place, right? So the amount of money that was coming in from the um, regular payments of the uh, from the mortgage owners was obviously slightly higher amount that you were giving out to the C uh, to the shareholders inside this uh, collateralized debt obligations. So far, therefore, for the banks, it's working perfectly fine. Why? Because uh, if the money is coming in and you're taking a certain amount of money off the top and you're keeping it, then it's good for you and the, everyone is happy because everyone's money, like the money is just stuck somewhere. And these investments are generally good. Why? Because prices were rising. So if someone ever defaulted inside the mortgage payments, then you can simply sell their house and get the amount of money, right? And can usually uh, pay it back uh, little by little to the sh uh, share shareholders inside your collateralized obligations. But then the demand increased very sharply because as I already said, the uh, Credit, uh, the credit became extremely cheap. So mortgages were given to people with bad credit history. Why? Because as I already said, there was a high amount of uh, perverse incentives by the bank to create as much debt as as much debt uh, as much uh, mortgages as possible because it led to higher credit, uh, profit margins for them. Now, so you see, because you have higher profit margins for the banks, there's a greater number of CD uh, uh, desire of higher profit margins for the banks, and you allowed them to create CDOs. Now they are giving away credit. Uh, uh, money to people they would not have done to previously because now there's a high opportunity of doing this because since the prices are rising, if anyone defaults now, they don't have to worry about not being able to get their money back. Previously, they were worried about giving it to people because you might just not get the entire money back, right? So, mortgages are given to people to ba with bad credit histories. These bad credit histories were then collated with other good uh, 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 with other good mortgages or good mortgages of, uh, of people with good credit histories and what essentially it led to was a situation where uh, a lot of these CDOs, the collateralized debt obligations, were not as safe investments, were not as good investments as they had been at the beginning of the cycle. Now, why would bad mortgages enter the system and no one find out? That is not supposed to happen and it shouldn't have happened. But the ones that allowed it to happen were credit rating agencies. What credit rating agencies do is they uh, rate the debt that these banks that these banks issue, right? the bonds, etc. Collateralized debt obligation would also be rated. Problem was, these credit rating agencies were also paid by the banks themselves, which meant that they had the perverse incentives to uh, increase the amount of, uh, the, increase the number of safe ratings that they gave to uh, the uh, mortgages in general. It's a big, big problem, primarily because it led to a huge perverse incentive to do, uh, to uh, uh, act in negative ways and create negative outcomes outside, uh, along uh, into this, right? So therefore, uh, they were given, uh, uh, so clearly the credit agencies were not doing the job well. To keep up with demand, mortgage was de uh, given or designed so that bor borrowers would fail to pay. So essentially at one point of time, because your houses were going up in value continuously, it made sense for the banks to give it to borrowers who would fail to repay the debt. And so they would be able to get the uh, get the house and they can sell it in the market because the uh, rise was increasing that high. Like the improvement in, um, like the uh, rise in price was that high. Like for example, Houses were rising at a rate of 14% per year. That is incredible because the interest rates that Alan Greenspan proposed were 1%. So for 1%, you're getting 14% investment return. That is a very good deal, right? So why? what eventually led to the situation? What essentially led to the situation was that it fueled demand and housing prices kept climbing. Like it kept climbing to an insane amount, right? Uh, that's not all. Like that, that's not where the system stopped. And feels like it's quite bad already because everything depends on the market system and everything is now dependent on the market system with bad credit rating with, bad, with uh, borrowers who are, have bad credit histories right but that if like at that point of time if that had stopped that wouldn't have spread throughout the economy but the problem was 
Credit defaults, default swaps were introduced as in, uh, insurance against the collapse of prices by companies like AIG. Um, so AIG expected that people, that prices would continue to rise forever for some reason and that people would continue to pay, pay their mortgages and that would mean that their, the prices would never collapse. If prices collapsed, AIG would give money away and go, would uh, compensate those whose money was being lost because of the prices being collapsed. That, the ones, for example, the one in the, share, the banks who were going to have to pay the shareholders uh, of the C CDOs and the other people who had invested inside CDOs in general, if they lose any money, the, ins uh, the uh, insurance companies would pay them. These were then repackaged and they were sold to other lenders who were essentially now speculating on whether prices would fall or not. So you don't need to understand the fourth level of this. Until the third level, let's realize everyone is now dependent on that one mortgage payment that start, became like existed at the start. So you see when I tell you everything is interconnected, right? Now, with everything like with everything dependent on this system, why did the like what did it rely upon? It relied upon the bubble never bursting and the prices to keep increasing, right? But no, why did the price keep? Why did the price eventually start falling? Because understand, um, you have to keep like um, the idea is some borrowers would eventually default because you expect some of them to default, right? And uh, the mortgage payments that you were making for new, like the banks obviously wanted to refinance the mortgages because the mortgage, like um, like the price of the houses were kept increasing, right? So the amount of money you have to borrow just in order to buy the house now is a lot higher. So the mortgage payment that you have to make every month because of the principal being higher already, the mortgage payment is, payment is also higher. If that is true, mortgage has become very expensive. And as house and as house prices rose, mortgage a lot of buyers, uh, people who bought these houses, simply couldn't keep up with the mortgage payments. Once they couldn't keep up with the mortgage payments, what eventually resulted in that these borrowers defaulted. Once these borrowers defaulted, uh, banks tried to sell all the houses in the market, right? But here's the problem: if these borrowers default, then there's no there's no one to buy the houses in the market because these houses are just too expensive, and the ones who are going to buy had already bought a large majority of it. Given that's true and that after the, there were no buyers, house prices started falling and borrowers were now paying for a mortgage that was far higher than the house that they actually had. Like for example, as the mortgage, as the, uh, the diagram shows, right? Once the mortgage payers defaulted, the demand tanked and prices started falling. Now more buyers, owners started defaulting because it didn't make sense to hold on to a property whose value was lower than the amount that you were holding at that point of time. If that is true and uh, then you might as well default because there's no reason to keep paying this high amount to the bank back, back to the bank. Once they uh, once they defaulted, the banks started to try to sell the houses again. Obviously, they couldn't because of the fact that uh, because of the fact that uh, there was no one to buy these houses in the first place. Because there was no one to buy these houses, it eventually resulted into the banks being unable to uh, you know uh, sorry uh, the banks being unable to. Uh, give, continue giving credit because now all of their money was being stuck was stuck in investments and owning houses all over the country that were essentially worth nothing compared to the amount that they had paid previously to buy those houses. So banks started stop stop giving credit. Why? Primarily because at that point of time the stock market crashed again because everyone realized what was going on and uh, there was uh, the incident of the Lehman Brothers etc. All of that which doesn't need to go along in the finance lecture. But given that happened um, and everyone realized that the like there were a set of systems that, that there were a set of systems that had created and that that had become right. So yeah, my computer is uh, acting great. But, um, so the general idea is that um, banks were giving credit. As the banks were giving credit, uh, the demand reduced, and uh, everyone obviously started. Uh, and, uh, and as the banks started stopped giving credit, there was a bank run again, and all the things that you read about uh, that you heard about in the Great Depression started repeating again on this time. However, this time there was one good thing. Um, the John Maynard Keynes had already lived his life and had published his theories and now we knew that there is a problem if you don't improve the system. And therefore, uh, the response from the Federal Reserve was that $700 billion of bailout were announced with very transparent plans. As I said, look, um, this is very important for, the, uh, for debates that you do. Um, the financial system is completely dependent on you being able to uh, prove that uh, the people's confidence is going to come back. If people aren't people aren't confident, and people are not going to start spending, and people are not going to keep improving the system. If that is true. Then no matter what you do, if the confidence doesn't come back, your system is not going to improve, and you're not going to win debates, nor are you going to save the financial system. Therefore, uh, what the Federal Reserve did was they spent 700 billion to bail out. They announced transparent plans, 
said which uh, which banks they were going to save, which banks they were not. Uh, then after uh, after that, after the bailout plan, they announced a 700, 800 billion dollar stimulus to kickstart the economy. Then they took certain measures such as the Dodd Frank Act, which increased the transparency, uh, improved the improved the amount of regulation of derivatives. Um, large banks failing were also regulated. All of that eventually created a situation where uh, the bank, uh, where uh, we have um, the Federal Reserve kicking in and making sure that they were able to uh, uh, that they're able to save the economy, right? Um, yeah. So what can we learn from this entire situation? It means that banks were not regulated because the market was expected to correct itself. Uh, the market was expected to uh, fix itself and make sure that there would be no uh, out, out, outer effects inside the rest of the economy and that markets wouldn't uh, have any sort of perverse intention that the bankers would somehow, for some reason, uh, be the nicest actors in the world and not choose to do things for their profit. Um, that's obviously a stupid assumption to make. And it allowed things like deregulation, which created huge incentives to make risky assets. Uh, and as you can see, the deregulation meant that you were able to have, uh, like, uh, you didn't have to have as many. Um, um, yeah, you didn't, uh, deregulation meant that you did not have to have as many rules in order for banks to follow. You did not have to have as many credit requirements for the banks to follow that they could do whatever they wanted with their money, and they could do whatever they wanted with the amount of money that they were currently uh, that they uh, uh, took from the people. And there was significant amount of leverage in the system because everyone was borrowing money in order to do uh, in order and betting on the banks and betting on one particular set of assets. This is hugely problematic, as I already explained to you, because of the fact that. Um, the risky mortgages uh, and in general uh, led to a system that was built like a house of cards and eventually it collapsed altogether. And therefore bailouts are quite important because bailouts restore confidence in the economy. And this is why this, this second slide entirely about bailouts, right? Because understand, I'm just trying to make sure that you understand the focus of this entire argument, right? It's very important that you realize that you need to bring confidence back into the economy. Whatever else you do, no matter what else it is, you have to bring confidence back into the economy. It is not a uh, it's not exactly one of the possible solutions. It is the only and the main solution that can take place. Like make sure that the confidence in the economy comes back and whatever you, if you can prove that and you can prove that people will start spending, that's when you win the economic debate and finance debates, right? And that's what the entire situation, uh, because if you can bring the money back in the system, then finance will allocate it well, but without money in the system, there's no allocation. So we're screwed. Right. And there's something that Andrew Ross Sorkin said, and was a New York Times columnist at that time, um, said, I think people saw this as happening over there and that's not happening over here and this sense of interconnected was not realized until the very last moment which essentially meant as i already explained 100 uh, so many times before is that people never thought that what happened in the rest of the economy would happen to them and they didn't think that banks failing would affect them housing market failing would affect them never no one realized that at the very last second everything collapsed at the same time and people realized that you can't build a system built on uh, debt alone and you have to do a better job of making sure this works right to the last things right um, general responses to a crisis i've already explained to you the idea of uh, austerity you don't have to talk about that i've already explained to you the idea of a bailout we don't have to explain that again uh, we've already talked about bail-in and why that can sometimes be necessary last uh, of all we have to talk about um, the idea of what a quantitative easing could be Quantitative easing is basically, uh, again, uh, significant amount of money being spent from uh, the government to the system itself. And essentially what happens to the system is that um, once you spend a lot of money, uh, once, uh, and this is a different way of spending it, right? So what it essentially means is you buy the bonds of a large number of, um, of, of banks of, uh, 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 in this bond market. Once you start buying bonds, the prices of those bonds, uh, the prices of those bonds rise. What does this mean? Why? Because of the demand and supply effect. Because now there's greater amount of demand, so obviously the uh, supply is still constant of the banks of the companies who want to issue bonds. Now, once you bought bonds, what is happening? Uh, central bank has bought, bought bonds, right? For example, European Central Bank. Once they have bought uh, bought the bonds, what happens is those bonds are then uh, uh, those bonds essentially supply money to these companies. Once the companies see that the money that they're receiving is cheaper credit, and they can, and, and the government is not as uh, and is not imposing such high interest rates, they can safely borrow now. 
what they essentially do is they start investing more because the amount of money that they are getting from selling the bonds is something that they can use to start increasing production etc that's a general idea behind the uh, uh, bonds uh, behind the bond thing something very important right um a lot of people think that um one of the main reasons why the uh, european countries and the european union survived the 2007 crashes was mario draghi being elected as their president uh, as the ecb's president and he said that it's wait ecb or european i forgot but i think it was the uh, ecb so i'm sorry i forget but the idea is that he said that we are willing to do whatever it takes to save the european union now that is something that puts confidence uh, makes people feel confident and that's why uh, that is something that kicks out the economy and they said um, the confidence is one thing that you need to ensure inside the economy i just i only wanted to go back to that because i forgot to talk about it but regardless um so the uh, the quantity easing essentially uh, is useful primarily because it supplies money directly to businesses and it allows the stock market to rejuvenate and now a, a lot of, of of companies start buying bonds in the stock market because they feel like the government will start uh, will also will be there if they fail and uh, since a lot more money is now being generated in the stock market because the companies because companies see that the government has has increased the amount of demand for their for their bonds they no longer have to take loans from the banks or wait for loans from the banks at lower interest rates they can simply choose to offer bonds at lower interest rates since the demand for bonds has increased and that essentially means that the, in, uh, since the company starts spending the entire cycle of how company starts spending and more workers get hired etc etc as already explained uh, happens again now i'm going to explain the rest in a very short time primarily because i don't have much time and i've already exceeded time way too large an amount all right hedge funds and the effect that it can have on economies what are hedge funds hedge funds are essentially um uh, so they are financial corporations right and these are just financial companies that are i don't need to know much about them except the fact that they take uh, a greater amount of leverage which is essentially uh, using other people's money to buy things as we already talked about leverage banks loans etc they use a greater amount of leverage and therefore a greater amount of risk and they use that money in order to uh, in order to take uh, in order to generate a greater amount of returns than you would have through um, through uh, mutual funds etc uh, that which are far uh, less risky investments so what you would see is hedge funds wouldn't invest in you normally would never invest in uh, treasury bills or safe investments what they would invest in are investments that are likely to get them significantly higher amounts of returns but also significantly risk significantly high risks of uh, credit default and it is very important because if hedge funds start increasing and they start betting on the uh, betting on the government at any point of time hedge funds can uh, hedge funds and if you borrow a significant amount of money from hedge funds that one of time your government is essentially beholden to all these uh, hedge funds because they are imposing like th these companies are willing to take a risk on you and therefore your government starts borrowing from these hedge funds at significantly like massive amounts right why um because since hedge funds are willing to buy from you and are willing to uh, accept that you're going to give them uh, a, a large amount, a large interest rate these hedge funds are essentially telling your government that it's okay to borrow because eventually you'll be able to pay it back uh, once a government borrows from these hedge funds the problem is one they're imposing a cost to the future generation obviously it's good for the hedge fund but it's cost on the future generation but secondly if the government defaults it means that the government has essentially screwed over your credit rating for a long long period of time and hedge funds are less likely to be for giving up debt what does this mean hedge funds are essentially created uh, hedge funds are essentially invested upon invested in sorry by a large group uh, uh, by only uh, people of huge net worth people who are able to bully their governments and people who have significant political lobbies that's why hedge funds are dangerous because since they are tied up with the interests of rich people rich people who have access to governmental resources for example the us government or the european union what these hedge funds can do is essentially lobby to make sure that the debt of these companies is not forgiven if the debt of these companies countries is not forgiven then it's very dangerous to take debt from these hedge funds to begin with primarily because these hedge funds can then use the uh, use the network of high net net worth individuals that they have inside governments to influence the kinds of policies and the kinds of um, responses that uh, a developed country would have to a economy that's failing right now and therefore they borrowing heavily from hedge funds can essentially um, expose you to a significantly high amount of risk that you necessarily would not have once you're dealing with uh, other companies or other corporations obviously there are a lot of benefits from hedge funds because you wouldn't get 
uh, investments inside risky uh, risky economies without hedge funds doing it and sometimes investment is important but yes this is the general idea of why hedge funds are going to be quite dangerous and there are lots of reasons to regulate them but one of the one of the primary things about hedge funds is that they are not regulated they are extremely free to uh, like they, uh, they are they i would characterize them as quite shady and the effect that they can have on economy is significantly uh, dangerous primarily because they can um, at any point, uh, uh, because the balance sheet of these are these companies are not regulated to the same extent that you would regulate the balance sheet of others. As already explained, the uh, network of high net worth individuals who are inside these hedge funds, and also understand that these hedge funds use extremely highly leveraged uh, techniques. These leveraged techniques essentially mean that they are exposing themselves themselves to a high amount of risk. If these hedge funds are big enough, and they are, for example, billion dollar worth hedge funds, which are quite common. It's likely that the failing, failure of this hedge fund is likely to trigger economic crises and likely to trigger some amount of destabilization of the system itself. Obviously, it's not going to be as large as a bank failing, but you'll get what I mean. And the problem was, as I already explained to you, because of the high net worth of individuals who invest inside these hedge funds, it's likely that these hedge funds can get the government to issue directives that are favorable to these hedge funds. And therefore, it's very likely that these hedge funds are going to have a significant effect, especially as we go on further down the road. So yeah, that's why hedge funds are important and that's now you can debate about hedge funds. Yeah. Lastly, investment and commercial banks. I wanted to talk a lot about that, primarily because of the debate today on uh, uh, inside fundraiser. Uh, but I'm not going to ha have a lot of time to talk about them. So this general idea is, look, um, never ever, as one of the teams said in today's debate, uh, never copy or like do what one of the teams did in today's debate and claim that investment banks are less risky than commercial banks. They're not. Commercial banks' entire job is to evaluate which investments offer a sufficient return and which investments are most likely to uh, which events are most likely to eventually uh, cause um, uh, to justify the risk that they're taking and most likely usually around the time is that these com uh, commercial banks use people's money to uh, run and these commercial banks use people's money to uh, uh, make these investments and therefore they are far more likely to be conservative and uh, the investment that they make are likely to be a lot a lot more considered uh investment banks work just like in uh, just like any other investment company and they're far more likely to take risks because they have a lower threshold for uh risk that they're taking and the amount of time that you allow them to use people's money to um uh use people's money to uh, make the bets make their investments at that point of time you expose the people who put their money inside commercial banks to uh be exposed to them the regulation for these are uh, exist for example and this is the regulation i, I told you i will talk about regulation again um uh look the best what what does the puzzle why is the Basel three so important right um it's important because what it does is it, it, it forces uh most commercial banks to uh, all commercial banks sorry it forces all commercial banks to um adhere to a very strict set of ratios and policies and uh, uh, basically solve it. Uh, okay, why am I saying ratios? There's no need for you to know about ratios. Um, what it essentially does, it makes sure that the banks are a lot more solvent and the banks are a lot less risky and they're exposed to less risk overall. Why this is important? Primarily because if the banks are exposed to a higher amount of risk, it means you are exposed to a higher amount of risk and is dangerous for the, uh, uh, is dangerous uh, for um, uh, uh, consumers, uh, depositors to put their money in there. So if the banks have a lower amount of risk, it's likely that the banks will uh, that the banks will uh, be forced to, we have, will have a lower amount of uh, destabilization of the system that was, which was one of the important effects of regulation. So why am I saying this again, right? I already mentioned this earlier. It's because we talk, like you will hear a lot of good debaters, uh, knowledgeable debaters talk about Glass-Steagall Act, um, Dodd-Frank Act and all the other things, right? You don't know shit about them. Stop, uh, like don't remember these things. You don't need to remember these things. What you need to remember is the Basel three is the output of all of these things. Basel III eventually has made sure that the system itself is a lot safer than it used to be and the system is less likely to default in the same level. And so if anyone tries to mention Dodd-Frank Dodd ad, Glass-Steagall ad, etc., uh, make sure that you mention Basel III because it means that this uh, act is a lot less, it's not, uh, it's not as unsafe as they would like to point it out to be. Uh, right. Uh, but having said that, um, uh, it is a word on the investment commercial banks. Some of the biggest banks in the world are investment banks and which are which have their commercial banking wings and for example jp morgan chase um i'm not sure which is the other but uh yeah well as far as i think uh all these banks have um so, so, uh, have huge commercial banking wings and investment banking wings. why is it important why is it important it's because these banks influence a significant amount of policy pressure on the governments 
primarily because as I said, high net worth individuals translate into having significant amount of political power. And these banks are able to lobby for the policies that they want a lot more. They're able to lobby for the policies that they think are right a lot more. I wonder if I need to separate these two. It's highly unlikely that you are going to be able to claim that there's high net worth individuals are going to be able to claim that these banks failing is good. It's bad for the economy, is as bad for the economy. Because understand, if you break up big banks, what uh, the bad the bad effect of breaking up big banks is that is obviously the less uh, obvious part. Um, the bad effect of being a big bank is that you have less financial innovation, that there are less people willing to take risks with the money, and therefore the risky ventures inside the economy are less likely to be supported as much. Because if investment banks have the banking, uh, the backing of commercial bank, uh, banks behind them, and the amount of hugely safe balance sheet that commercial banks carry, that one of the time the investment banks, what they can essentially do is use that amount of money to uh, invest in more risky ventures inside the stock market and uh, in general markets itself. Uh, so the problem is there's investment banks uh, and they can obviously do uh, underwriting of IPOs, etc. that are far riskier. They can uh, have, uh, they can guarantee IPOs far better. The thing is, um, this could be quite good in certain cases because it means that tech companies or companies that are not necessarily, uh, uh, that cannot be evaluated uh, on our current understanding of the market but will become very important later on in the market can be game changing. These companies will get supported because now there's a greater appetite of risk that are being willing to take upon these companies. But at the same time, it also exposes the system to a lot more systematic risk. And we know that the system doesn't stop, like the risk doesn't stop with a certain bank. It happens throughout the system. So it's clear that it cannot be, like you cannot expect the system to minimize or arrest risk at a certain point, risk at a certain point of time, but it continues and cascades throughout the system. And that's why it's quite dangerous to have commercial bank existing. But as I already told you, it's very useful to have these banks and as a defense of this bank for there. But also understand commercial banks are having a reduction in their interest income and therefore for them to stay alive, they need to rely on fees income a lot more, which is where investment banks come in. So there's a huge debate there, which I cannot go into right now. And I do not want to go into right now, but there is something you should think about yourself. But also I've given you the basics to understand what you're going to be reading about. Um, in general, the investment, uh, the investment banks are as I said, they are far likely to be riskier, but as I said, it's very dangerous for allowing, to allow investment banks to uh, rely on the commercial banking uh, balance sheet, primarily because it allows them, a, give them a degree of uh, flexibility, which they wouldn't have if they were not part of the commercial banks, right? And that would essentially mean that these banks are allowed to grow too large, and that would lead to all of the effects of too big to fail, as I already said. Because remember, one of the main things that the regulation seeks to, under, uh, seeks to determine is reducing the systematic risk that a particular financial institution has to the rest of the system. If that is true, then the existence of two big to fail banks are an anathema to the system itself, primarily because this, uh, these banks are uh, the bringers of systematic risk throughout the entire financial system. Because if these banks exist and if these banks fail, then the entire financial system collapses around them, which is what happened in 2008. And that is why the investment commercial banks are so, like uh, the uh, regulations here are so important because you need to create a fine balance between the two. Right. Uh, in how to finance, like I think I, um, I wanted to explain this separately, but uh, I feel like I've done that throughout the, uh, throughout the lecture today. Uh, two things, right? Just remember two things. One, as I have mentioned a million times throughout, um, financial system is not static. It is affected by everything. It's dynamic. It changes all the time. And therefore, uh, we have updating, updated regulations, updated laws, and therefore, no matter what you claim, no matter what anyone claims about the financial system being inefficient and being unable to take care of itself, it will be true as long as the government isn't willing to go ahead and regulate them. Because in the periods of, of time where we had higher amounts of regulation, we had significant amounts of financial system improving as well. Obviously, the financial innovation was less because you could do fewer things with the, uh, you, uh, you could take fewer risks with the entire system. But obviously, it's quite important to realize the importance of um, uh, reducing the amount of risk in the system to begin with, right? So the financial system will regulate itself, but un if the government and uh, if, if the government doesn't go ahead and create laws and a, a framework under which it will regulate, under which it is regulated, it will give in to perverse incentives. Therefore, remember, the banks aren't the problem; the guardians of the financial system are. I may sound like a proponent of the Wall Street bankers right now, but I don't. I believe they should have been punished. But regardless, the idea is that these banks need to be regulated because of the fact that the financial system is the one which must regulate them. Lastly, um, make sure that you talk about financial innovation and the importance of finance inside the economy itself. 
it's not just a fine it's not just okay to say finance is important understand why finance is important to the real economy to the lives of people to the lives of everyone involved because the reduction of credit reduction of deposits inside the banks is very dangerous and it could have a significantly negative effect inside the lives of everyone involved inside the financial system which is basically you me and everybody even if someone isn't a part of the financial system keeps it's, it's someone keeps money inside their pillowcases doesn't do anything with it sleeps at home and doesn't obviously everyone sleeps at home my bad but uh, doesn't uh, interact with the financial system at all even they are going to be affected by it because the financial system is an integral part of the real economy right now so whenever you are debating on the financial system it's incredibly important that you make that transition into um, talking about the uh, real economy because otherwise you're not going to win debates like at least you're not going to win debates that i'm judging and i hope that uh, whoever judges debates doesn't divide people on the basis of saying things like the banks are going to benefit the banks are going to benefit will never be as important as the real people who are going to benefit out of it therefore if you as we know impacting is important impact which says banks are going to benefit has no value impact which says banks benefiting affect and help people in this particular manner helps and that is important so yeah i hope you're clear on what the financial system is um yeah so i've ranted and i've spent a lot of time i'll just like take the next minute and just thank bbc for um giving us a chance and uh, giving everyone uh, giving everyone the chance to learn uh for th uh, and uh in, in the current the current administration of bdc uh, and everyone involved with it uh, is genuinely one of the best uh, in initiatives i've seen anyone uh, i've seen any administration take and it's an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, pass along any of the knowledge i have gathered from debating and my course uh, my learning etc for all these years and i hope that anyone who feels like they need any sort of clarification can come up to me i am definitely available i may reply a little bit late but i definitely hope to get uh, definitely will get back to you but yeah just wanted to thank vdc for giving me the opportunity and giving everyone the opportunity to learn from this and yeah thanks guys uh this was fun yeah i made the uh, i made the thanks slide as well yeah and study finance